And we left off in chapter 17 where Paul spoke to the Stoics and the Epicurean leaders on Mars Hill in Athens concerning their unknown God. Paul shared with them concerning that the unknown God is the creator who made the world and everything in it. And since he is Lord of heavens and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with man's hands. So Paul declared that our creator has made from one blood, and he's speaking of Adam and Eve, who God created, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And he explains to them that God has overlooked these times of ignorance because they didn't know, right? The people did not know. They're, they're looking at the, the unknown God, but they didn't know quite who he was. But now commands, the Lord commands, that all men turn away from the worship of idols because there is an appointed day that, that God has uh, ordained in, in time, right? That he will judge the world in righteousness by the man he has ordained, Jesus Christ his Son, whom he rose from the dead, and it is through his resurrection that we have our assurance of salvation from the judgment against all wickedness that is to come. So, as we saw last week, some of the Epicureans and some of the Stoics, they mocked him and rejected all that he spoke, while others, they put him off saying, hey, look, maybe we'll listen to you another time again, right? But they put him off. But yet a small handful of people received the word that he spoke, and they believed. And they went with him as he departed. So this morning we will find that Paul departs Athens while he's making his way on his second missionary journey. And he will travel to Corinth, still waiting on Silas and Timothy. And Paul sees a city that is governed, man, they are overtaken by idols and idolatry. So... What will Paul do? I'm sure you know the answer to that based off his character because we've learned that he doesn't stay still. He's not going to just sit and twiddle his thumbs waiting for Timothy and and Silas to show up. No, he goes into the synagogues like he always does. But this time he goes alone. And he begins to reason with the Jews along by the marketplace as well. And so we pick things up in Acts, Acts chapter 18 Verse 1, it says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. So he leaves Athens, one of the most philosophical centers of the ancient world at this time, and travels 50 miles to Corinth, which this city is entirely different from Athens. Athens is more known for its academia and culture, while Corinth was wildly extravagant and was more known for its commerce. Corinth was a major city in the Roman Empire. It was a business center, having two harbors there. So you had trading going north and south and trading at the sea going from east to west. So this city was an important crossroads of trade, and I would say travel as well. And Corinth was a center of worship of the goddess Aphrodite, also known as Venus. She was the goddess of love, fertility, and sexuality which sexual immorality was permitted and widely practiced in the name of religion. So here, here's Paul, the Apostle Paul. He's in the city of Corinth, verse 2. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So there, there was this persecution against the Jews that was happening in Rome. And we learned this while Paul and Silas were in Thessalonica. Remember when they brought accusations against him, but they only used the fact that they were Jews who brought trouble. And it's because of this great persecution from Claudius. And so here we have Aquila and Priscilla. They had to leave Italy, and now they're here in Corinth. And Paul comes to them. Now, Though it is not clearly stated, it appears that they may have already been believers in the Lord. If not, uh, Paul may have just led them to the Lord pretty quickly during this time as he came to them. In verse 3, so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked 
For by occupation, they were all tent makers. So Paul had this trade in common with them. And it's probably what, how he ended up you know, drawing to them and bringing up this conversation with them. And ends up staying with them because they were all tent makers. Now, most Jewish boys were brought up by their fathers, not only to study theology, which they all desired for their sons to be these great teachers, these great rabbis, but the fathers also desired that, de- desired that their boys learn a trade to be able to support themselves in case being a teacher doesn't work out. So Paul learned the trade as a tent maker. In other words, basically they needed that backup plan. You can be educated in theology and go around and teach it, but unless you have a foot in the door or know someone, you needed to have a backup plan to be able to support yourself. I remember that growing up. I wanted to be a musician. You know, I wanted to go and put out albums and somehow just tour and do music. But my mom was like, you need a backup plan. You need to think about this, you know, because, you know, not everyone, you know, gets that foot in the door. So have that backup plan. Thus, I joined the Navy, and that basically took me a completely different direction. (laughs) But, you know, Paul, as we remember, um, before the road to Damascus, he had everything lined up for himself. He was taught and mentored by the great rabbis, you know, and had a promising future. But things changed on the road to Damascus, where Paul would use his trade, it flipped, right, to support himself while teaching the word, the gospel from the scriptures to show that Jesus is the Christ to others. And so he finds Aquila and Priscilla probably out there working, makes conversation, ends up staying with them, and they're all tent makers. And so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation, they were tent makers. And he then, we see what he does, he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. So he would work as a tent maker. He wasn't fully one of the guys in the, in, in the synagogues, but he would work as a tent maker. But on every Sabbath, Paul would go and reason with the Jews in the synagogues. And as you can see, it says he persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Now, we see that Paul takes his time here. He just doesn't go out there and preaches a sermon, and the next thing we read is the results from it. No, He's really taking his time to pour into them. He reasoned with them every Sabbath with the Jews and Greeks, giving them a reason to believe that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the prophesied promised Messiah through the Scriptures, to bring forth a reasonable faith. And it seems that this was quite effective because the result was that he persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Verse 5, when Silas and Timothy, so they're, are making their way back, had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. So we have, you know, Silas and Timothy, they finally had reached Paul, you know, because first they were going to meet him in Athens, and then Paul makes his way to, to Corinth. And he's there this whole time by himself. But here Paul is now pressed by the Holy Spirit, to testify to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. So up to this point, it seems as if Paul had laid out the whole case, laid out the scriptures, hey, that this needed to be done. Here's this scripture. This needs to be fulfilled to meet the requirement as the Messiah, right? And now he's going to make it very clear to the Jews that Jesus, in fact, is the Christ. He met all the requirements, fulfilled all the prophecy. And he was compelled by the Spirit to testify how Jesus fulfilled the scriptures. Verse 6, But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garment and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. There's a lot happening within this verse. So they opposed him and blasphemed which must have been directed at Jesus Christ, and blaspheming, they indirectly declared the deity of Jesus as God because you can only blaspheme against God. And so Paul takes his robe and he shakes it. It's sort of a gesture, and I'll explain that in a second, but says, I am clean. 
He's not speaking to them in the flesh, calling them names or anything. Oh, yeah, you know, let me shake my dirt, you know, you guys off of me. That, he doesn't approach it that way. But Paul responds to their rejection of the message just as Jesus would have him do. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 14, he says, And whoever will not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. And Paul does this, right? But not in a condescending way. But it's more of, I don't want to take any more time from you, let alone a speck of dust from you. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm going to remove myself uh, from you. In other words, I leave you with the message of the gospel that you rejected and your judgment has been weighed uh, itself before God. And to ease your conscience, I will leave you all alone with it, right? I won't even take a speck of dust from you. And Paul also, uh, says also, your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles, basically saying your, your own rejection to the message of Christ is your responsibility. He said, I am clean, meaning he fulfilled his calling of giving them the message instead of carrying on and on trying to persuade even them. Paul is also following the discernment of Jesus when Jesus shared in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. He says, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. Let them trample them under their feet and turn, and lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. So it is important for us to realize that Paul does not respond to these lost Jews in anger, but responds out of obedience to the Lord, and it is done in love. Paul did exactly what the Lord called him to do. He gave them the message, but they rejected it, and that's not on him. It's very similar to Ezekiel in chapter 33 when he speaks of the watchmen. I want you to listen to this. So it's Ezekiel chapter 33. He says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the the sword coming upon the land. If he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take uh, the warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes the warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes uh, any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So Paul has blown the trumpet. You know, he gave him the message of Christ and they chose not to listen and they reject the message. And so Paul declares, look, I am clean of your responsibility. And he follows this with his next same statement that he is turning to the Gentiles from now on. Verse 7, And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So he didn't travel very far. He just basically walked out of the synagogue, and right there is Justice's house. And probably his wall was probably right up against, you know, part of the, the synagogue. And, but here we have Justice. He's a Gentile. He's a worshiper of God. And uh, <clears throat> his hap, ha, house happens to be right next door. Verse 8. So in this moment, he was just in the synagogue. Paul said what he had to say. And when he was done, he walked out, right? So now there's kind of a glimpse of what happens in the synagogue. This is verse 8. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. Crispus, he was the leader, right, of the synagogue. He kind of ran the order of service, but apparently he listened to the word that Paul spoke and believed on the Lord along with his entire household. And we can recognize Crispus when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, right, he's in Corinth, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. He was whom Paul was able to baptize along with Christmas and his household, uh, they, they were believing. 
So you'll see his name again, this leader of the synagogue who came to the Lord. It's pretty cool, right? And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. So there was fruit uh, from the time Paul spent in the synagogue that many came to believe. But notice in verse 5 that all this, all this was by the prompting, you know, of the Holy Spirit. Paul was compelled, you know, completely led by the timing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit pressed on him to declare the message. It was clear what he was supposed to do. And then it's like the Spirit saying, the time is now. Through the act of the Holy Spirit, Paul testifies to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. And although many opposed and rejected the message, many came to believe on the Lord. And this is the work right here with these folks. This was the work that needed to happen. So it's like mission accomplished. It just kind of tells us that, you know, not everyone is going to receive the message. But there's always those who are searching for hope, searching for the truth. And when the Spirit of the Lord compels you to, to share the gospel in such a way or whatever word the Lord gives on your heart, you obey it. And just as we see, this timing is never up to us to decide. The Spirit of the Lord will tell you when it's time. We only need to seek the Lord and trust in His timing. Because behind the scenes, God is working. God is making His preparations for His perfect timing. God is working in you, not only in the situation, but he's working in you. So there's, there's this process that is happening within you where you are being prepared for his good work through you. And it is important that we are led by the Holy Spirit in his work. We cannot be ambitious about his work or on the flip side, lazy about his work. No, we need to be right in step with the Holy Spirit and be sensitive to Him. We need to have our focus on the Lord to include a right heart, right? Because if you read in Isaiah, you know, they were in, in the first chapter, they were all in a repetitious, they were all in a routine and they were giving sacrifices to the Lord, but their heart wasn't in it. And the Lord was like, I'd rather you guys just stay home and get right than come here and do the routine, you know, we have to have that right heart when we serve. And if service is only based on how you feel during the week or what you want to do, how will his work ever get done? How will it ever get done? What is God, you know, what is God's work in your heart through the things you keep trying to avoid? I mean, what good is it? You know, if God is showing you something, in front of you, and you're like looking at it like, oh, you know, um, I'll just wait to see, you know, somebody else does it. And then when somebody else does it, you're like, yo, I've, I avoided that. I'm free of that. You know, I don't have to do it. If you see a need that you know you're very well capable of doing, and the Spirit of the Lord is prompting you, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. See that? You saw, you saw the need. All right? We need to move forward in it. Don't set boundaries on the Lord, on his work in your life. A servant never does that, but rather a servant obeys the Lord. They're ready to obey. We should never wait for someone else to do it. No, be led by the Spirit and allow God to have his way in shaping you. Remember, the clay never tells the potter what they should be or what their use should be used for right? No, the potter shapes the clay into the vessel he wants to use. God is the potter and we are the clay. That's the bottom line, amen? So the vessel, which is Paul, was prompted by the Holy Spirit and he obeyed. And many came to believe on the name of the Lord. Now, was that Paul's work? No, it was the Lord's work in his life. God used Paul, the vessel, right? And drew many people to himself, and I love it. Verse 9. So this great work is done. It's evening time. And Paul, you know, is about to go to bed and probably falls asleep. And it says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. He says, Do not be afraid. 
Now, why would the Lord tell Paul, do not be afraid? It's probably because Paul was afraid. You know, Paul is just like you and I. You know, he's responding no different than you and I would respond. And sometimes we have to see Paul not just as this great apostle, a great saint. He is. But he's also human like us, right? But why was Paul afraid? I mean, all these people came to the Lord. And of course, you know, there were those who opposed him. But there was this great work that just happened. Maybe he was counting down the minutes of when the next beating will happen. Remember, those kind of beatings don't happen, you know, in our society, you know, through the religious leaders. They just don't. And Paul had, he had been stoned. He had been whipped with lashes and he had been beaten. So he may be, you know, here afraid, thinking that, okay, something's about to happen. You know, every, every blessing comes with the ones who oppose. But what is unique about what is happening here is that the Lord would come to Paul in the night by vision while Paul was in the midst of the blessing in his ministry, and here he is afraid, not knowing what to expect. And what is happening is that the Lord is intervening, right, in this fear and prevents Paul from making a, his decision, which was to leave and move on to the next place. Kind of, hey, I'm going to get out of Dodge, you know, before a massive mob comes from this massive you know, wicked city, and leave Corinth early before the Lord wanted him to. And as we will see, we're talking about a matter of one year and six months early. And that's a significant amount of time. And why was Paul wanting to leave? Because he feared, he was afraid. He was about to make a decision based on fear. And we've seen that so many times in, in the Old Testament where all things are done, like Abraham, you know, Jacob. They make these decisions based off of fear. Well, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, it says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Now, think about that. The fear of man brings a, and, and the word here in Greek is mokish, a snare, meaning a trap, Right? The Bible says also in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So here we have these great two scriptures speaking of what fear does. In Proverbs, it says it traps you, which is true. Traps us into making quick decisions, probably irrational decisions at times. Traps us where we can't even move. Sometimes we're like frozen in fear. But when you trust in the Lord, and that's where your trust is placed on, it says you shall be safe. The other scripture was written by none other than Paul himself to Timothy, a young pastor, encouraging him, saying, hey, Timothy, God has not equipped you with the spirit of fear. Don't fall for the traps. Through God, he gives you a sound mind right? Power and love. But the sound mind I wanted us to look at. Yet here, we are looking, right, one of the, at the great saints right here. We have the Apostle Paul, and he's just like any one of us who can be subject to fear, just like Abraham, just like Jacob, just like you and me. We can all at times in our lives be afraid, but we are not to be governed by fear. Rather, we are to recognize it in our lives and turn to the Lord, right? Because you'll be safe. He'll give you a sober mind. And we need to turn to him in prayer and in his word. And God always leads us. He always speaks to us in his word. He is faithful and he is true. And he will give us that sound mind. And so Paul is being real here. He is afraid. He thinks it's time to move on. But the Lord comes to him as he has many times come to us and comforts him as he has come to us many times and comforts us. And says to Paul, uh, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. Can you saw in the midst of Paul's fear is that he would go silent. God tells him to speak and not go silent. 
And God reassures Paul and says, for I am with you. Do not be afraid. Why? Because I'm with you. Wow. You know, same words God has used with Abraham and Jacob. His word is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And maybe someone that is listening or someone here has fear that they are dealing with today. Whatever your situation is or whatever you are facing in your life, and it has got you silent or maybe even paralyzed inwardly. I want you to look this. I want you to be reassured and encouraged, right, that the Lord is telling you, do not be afraid for I am with you. Keep talking to me. Keep praying. Do not keep silent. Don't close me out. God is with you and he is listening. This is the greatest promise that we we can stand on that we see in the scriptures. And the Lord wants to remove that spirit of fear out of you and give you his peace and his comfort and his love for he is with you. There's no greater word that you can receive than I am with you. And he's telling you that right now. And the Lord tells Paul, for I am with you. No one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. I am with you, Paul. No one will lay a finger on you, says the Lord. I need you here, right where you are, right where you are at, Paul. For I have many people in this city that will be saved. You need to stay. Again, you know, Corinth, it was a wicked city. It promoted immorality in the name of religion. The city was truly a dark place. Now, when Paul writes this letter to the Romans, he nails the status of mankind in the first three chapters, how man is born in Adam in sin, and sin has manifested itself through mankind. Now, when we read Romans chapter 1, verses 23 through 32, there is no doubt that what he writes is a mirror image of Corinth. All he had to do was look outside around him. He writes, Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Talk speaking of the idols. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For, every, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, isn't that the truth right here? Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. Now here's the list. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. I want you to understand that when Paul wrote to the Romans, he wrote that letter when he was in Corinth. He tells you how wicked this place truly was and how dark it was. And yet the Lord tells him, I have many people in this city. Do not be afraid. You know, there's many here that will be saved. My work is not done here through you. Do not be afraid. You're going to be protected, right? 
So what does Paul do? Verse 11, he continues there a year and six months teaching the word of God among the people. He obeyed the Lord. Ended up staying there for 18 months. I don't think he even had that, that thought of how long am I going to be here? That's a good amount of time. And this would be the second place that he stayed for a good amount of time. The longest was in Ephesus for three years. And as you know, the time here, you know, that he spent was planning a church. And we will see that later because he addresses the church when trouble arises. There were some problems. And he wrote 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians to address those. So, you know, God came to Paul, tells him to stay, basically to stay and do not be afraid. I am with you. No one will touch you. And so God addresses that. Here comes the next day. When Gallio was proconsul of Archaea, or he was a Roman ruler there, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. So the very thing that Paul was already fearing was starting to happen. But he got the word of the Lord, and so that fear is gone. This is what he was expecting. So here are the charges they bring to him. They sit in verse 13 saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, as he was about to say something, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names of your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And verse 16, and he drove them from the judgment seat. So this proconsul saw rightfully that the government had no role in attempting to decide religious matters. He didn't want to deal with that. But if they were of wrongdoing and wicked crimes, let's deal with it. So he sends them out, probably through order, of, you know, by his security, probably saying, okay, get these guys out of here kind of thing. And he gets them out of there. Verse 17, Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no, no notice of these things. He, what, he just kind of turned his eye, you know. So we have these Gentiles, they wanted nothing to do with the Jews and their contentions. And this completely backfired against Sosthenes and the Jews that were with him. And he ends up taking a beating. Now, Sosthenes, they says that he's the, relate, uh, the leader now, was probably the one who replaced Crispus. But it seems that Sosthenes is the one who brought Paul in with the charges, the accusations. But what's interesting about Sosthenes is apparently later, he becomes a believer of the Lord and becomes a Christian because Paul writes in his letter in 1 Corinthians, uh, in the chapter 1, verse 1, he writes, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, right? He would eventually travel with uh, the apostle Paul later, but it's just is pretty amazing, right? Only God, only God would do this. So, verse 18, Paul still remained a good while, then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla Aquila and Aquila were with him. I just love these two. Every time I read their name, I just, I just love them. They, uh, they were with him. He had his hair cut off at uh, Centria, for they had, to, had taken a vow. So this vow would be a vow of the Nazarite, all right, which is a vow to se separate yourself to the Lord. Right? And if you want to know more about this, it's in Numbers chapter 6. Verse 19, and he came to Ephesus, meaning this is the first time he comes to Ephesus, and he comes with Priscilla and Aquila, and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing, and he sailed from Ephesus which this feast is believed to be the Passover feast, one of the great feasts, and is wanting to go there, you know, to be a witness unto the Lord there. But I will return to you again, God willing, is what he said, and he sailed to Ephesus. Yet, yet in the midst of this, his, his idea of going to Jerusalem, he sees the open door in Ephesus and tells them, I will return 
God willing. And like I said previously, he would end up spending three years in Ephesus. So, in a sense, God was willing. Uh, and that would be on his third missionary journey. Verse 22, And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, you know, when, they, when you see gone up, all right, it means that uh, he had gone up to Jerusalem, which any time uh, you go to Jerusalem, you're going up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is on a mountain or a, or a large, large hill called Mount Zion. So you go up to Jerusalem, and then you will leave and you'll end up going down. So we see him going to Jerusalem, fulfilling his Nazarite vow in the temple. Then he departs and he went down to Antioch. And this right here will be the end of his second missionary journey. He returned to his home church in Antioch, which is in modern day Syria. Verse 23, and he spent some time there. He departed and went over the region of Galatia and Pergia in order strengthening all the disciples. So here, again, the character of Paul. He's not one that likes to stay in one place. And it's, it's funny because if you're in the military, you kind of get that, that feeling as well. Because like, every three years, you're having to move. You're picking orders and you're going. You're picking orders and you're going. And so we got kind of used to that. And we're already in our third year here. And part of me is just like, there's this part of me is like, when are we leaving? <laughs> kind of thing. And... Uh, that's just my mind, you know, you know, and at the same time, I'm like, we're not going anywhere, you know, I'm pretty settled here, as long as the Lord keeps me here, but that's just that, it's that funny feeling, you just, you're ready, you're ready to move. So Paul now heads out after some time and begins his third missionary journey on verse 23, and he went over the region of Galatia and Pergia, which is modern day Turkey. He didn't stay still, and in, in this order, and strengthening all the disciples, now, here we come in towards this, this, this is a great lesson right here. So now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So we're introduced to, the, uh, to this man named Apollos, who seems to be a missionary called by God alone because we don't have any idea where he was sent from, whether it, he was commissioned by a congregation or by an apostle. And Apollos is a Greek name, yet he was a Jew, which made him a Hellenist Jew. He is described as an eloquent man, as and he is well-learned and well-spoken. He was mighty in the scriptures, meaning that uh, he was well-taught, knew the Old Testament very well, being instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in spirit, as in he boiled in his spirit. Is, is it like, is it bubbled over, you know, with enthusiasm and fire? And he spoke and taught accurately. Well, of course he did, right? He came from Alexandria in North Africa. This was the great centers of Greek culture with the great university that had one of the finest libraries in the world. And we're talking, this is like Ivy League, right? So, you know, here he is well-cultured in the Jews. He is well-cultured in the Greeks. And he's also well-cultured in many of the different cultures of the world. So as we see this description, he's very, very educated. And it's in God's word right here. This man was off the charts, right? But his doctrine concerning Jesus was deficient. He knew the baptism of John, symbolizing the cleansing of God for repentance, and he knew of the Messiah. But Apollos had yet to learn the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So he shows up to Ephesus, right? And he began to speak boldly in the synagogues. But... When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they publicly roasted him on the things that he did not know. No, they didn't do that. They went to eat after, you know, his old speech and sermon, having a, a roast pastor for lunch, sharing with everyone how wrong this guy was. No, they listened to him. So rather than speaking out to him publicly, they took him aside privately and they explained things to him. Just like it says in the scriptures, you know, but when they heard 
heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They shared with him the truth of Jesus Christ and his promise of the Holy Spirit, meaning he listened to everything, because you got to see that. If they're able to share something, he's listening, he's receiving, right? So he received everything with such humility from someone who's this highly educated. Verse 27, now when he desired to cross Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So what we see is Apollos. He ends up leaving Ephesus. And what we do know is that he went to Corinth. Because if you remember, there was the people of the church that began to debate who should be the leader, who should be pastor. People were saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, yet they were dealing with their carnal issues in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But here, Apollos goes there. He was recommended by the disciples to receive him, to give him an opportunity to help with them. Now what is important, what is important here for us to see and why Apollos appears here is that although he was talented, highly educated, eloquent, and was able to teach and speak boldly, the one thing that stands alone here with Apollos is that he was teachable. Despite his resume, he received the teaching of Priscilla and Aquila. And the truth is, you know, you could be all these things, but if you're not teachable, None of this matters. It doesn't hold any weight. The truth is, promotion in the body of Christ is determined by the person's willingness to be teachable, right? It's the truth. No one is above being taught. Apollos wasn't like, no, I'm good, or if I'm sure you've heard these words, I know, I know, I know that too. No, none of that was in his heart. He's teachable. He listened and with humility received the teaching of Priscilla and Aquila. He is a man that wanted to continue to grow. And this right here is what's noticed by the brethren. When it came to promotion, he was sent by them to do a work for the Lord in Corinth because he was teachable. He was willing to grow in the Lord, just as we are all still growing in the Lord from glory to glory to glory. Not any of us will ever reach a place where we have attained it all. But yet there are those who walk on a dangerous path where they believe they do. They become not teachable. And therefore, their growth stops. It ceases. And the body of Christ notices that too. Promotion will end up getting passed over this person. And they'll become bitter and upset. Why? Because they ceased to grow. Having all the talent, the education, able to gather the crowds, be a great speaker is absolutely useless to the Lord's ministry if you are ceasing to grow, believing that you have it all. So I will say it again. Wherever the Lord calls you and uses you with his great gifting for effectiveness, doing a work in his ministry, it will always be determined by your willingness to be teachable. Apollos was a great example for us. And what I love about the body of Christ, though, this is what I just love, is that there are plenty of Priscilla's and Aquila's within the body that we can always be taught by. And I'm fortunate to have, you know, brothers and sisters like them around my life. And through their faithfulness to the Lord, they are constantly teaching us, helping us grow. And I praise the Lord for them. I love our Priscilla's and Aquila's out there. Right? And if, you're, if anything, be a Priscilla and Aquila to someone else. Speak into their life. Help them grow. And I would just encourage you guys, just keep growing in him and keep being teachable. Amen. Amen. Let us pray.